Hello everybody and welcome to today's webinar. Thank you for joining. Uh, we are, today's topic is submeter GPS accuracy on a budget. My name is Trevor Brown. I am the Natural Resources Market Manager from Juniper Systems. Also on the line we have Scott Hunter. Hello everyone. And Scott's going to be helping with moderating. If you have questions, please use your GoToMeeting panel and you can ask those questions. We'll be sure to follow up after the meeting uh, if we don't get to them during the meeting. Uh, as we also have on the line Stephanie Gozelin. She is the GNSS Solutions Manager from Effigis in Montreal. Hello, everyone. Okay. Again, thanks for joining today's webinar. Achieving submeter GPS accuracy on a budget. Uh, here's the agenda for today. Uh, we do have uh, a one hour long web webinar and we plan to uh, complete that early at about 50 minutes so that everybody can get back to their day. We are recording this webinar so if you have to leave early or if you would like to have a recorded version of this webinar we are going to post that and make that available. And here is the agenda for today as well. We are first going to do a brief introduction of Juniper Systems as well as our business partner Effigis in Montreal as I mentioned earlier. Uh, we are then going to look at the components of this solution which is Archer 2 submeter accuracy GPS and all of the components. We are then going to review the exam some example data sets that kind of show how and the results of some of the testing that we've done to kind of verify that we are indeed receiving submeter GPS accuracy uh, with this solution. Finally, we're going to move to actual software demonstrations where you'll get to get an understanding of the look and feel of EasyTag CE, the mobile software uh, as well. Uh, we're finally then going to look at EasyServe post-processing software and then we're going to wrap it up with some questions. Okay, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are Juniper Systems. Many of you already know our company. We are a U.S.-based manufacturer of ultra-rugged field computers. Uh, here's kind of a brief look at our, our product line here. And we are also, as many of you may know or may not know, we are affiliated with Campbell Scientific. They're actually just located across the Pau cow pasture here in Logan, Utah. We are uh, located in the far northern part of the state in the Mountain Valley near the Idaho border. Camel Scientific is uh, a recognized world leader in creating data loggers uh, that attach to a wide range of sensors. And they're our longtime business partner. And, uh, and next we have uh, an introduction for Epigis in Montreal, a business partner. Yes, so I'm Stephanie, as um, Trevor presented me. So I work at Epigis in uh, Montreal, Canada. Effigis is a leader in geomatics, uh, so geomatics solution in different fields. Uh, today, here with Jennifer, we're presenting our OnPaz software product line, so GPS software for the field and for the office. Back to you, Trevor. Thank you, Stephanie. All right, uh, I'll, we have some brief introduction slides with Juniper Systems. I will go through these relatively quickly, quickly because I want to make sure and leave a lot of time for demonstration. Uh, this, is, this slide is just meant to depict that we have a long history uh, as working in field data collection. Uh, we changed our name to Juniper Systems in 2001, but we have been creating field computers for a long time before that just by different names. All right, and here is our complete product line. We have, uh, you know, depending on the type of field data collection that you're doing, you may choose one with buttons, touchscreen, uh, various types of GPS, for example. But most people know our company as uh, ultra rugged, built to last, and that's kind of what this slide is also meant to depict. This is a, a polyquarter 600 uh, field data recorder that we had built in the late 80s. There's a fleet of these that are still being used uh, by NOAA as they go out and monitor groundfish uh, in, the in, in the Bering Strait around Alaska. Here's our Mesa rugged notepad. It has a very large field display that fits well in the hand. Here's our newest product, the Archer 2. has a really great display. This is definitely my new favorite. And here's our, our tried and tested Allegro product that has the big keypad. It's really meant for a high production data entry where people value and want to enter data with that keypad in, in a very rapid manner. 
All right, let's go ahead and jump on into the, the bulk of our presentation. Uh, the next topic, we wanted to just give a brief overview of the components of this Archer 2 submeter uh, package and solution that has worked well for a lot of our customers, and that's really the intent of today is to kind of just share with, with the broader audience uh, some solutions that we know work well with some of our existing customers. All right, you really have three components. You have your EasyTag CE mobile software, you have your Archer Field PC, and optionally, you have the ability to post-process your data using the EasyServe Office software. Now, EasyServe is not, necess it's not necessary, it is optional, and you, you can collect field data using EasyTag CE, and many people do that, and they don't choose to post-process. So really, depending on your type of application, if, you, if you're happy with a, a two-meter GPS solution, uh, then you, there's really no need to post-process, um, but if you do want to just get the best possible accuracy you can using your Archer 2, as well as really increase your confidence in the results that you have, then we recommend using the EasyServe post-processing software. I also wanted to mention that uh, you can also run Esri ArcPad on the Archer 2, and there is a, a GNSS driver that comes with EasyServe that allows you to post-process field data that's collected uh, using Esri ArcPad. Now, uh, additionally, I wanted to, just prior to starting with some of the example data sets, I wanted to kind of uh, make the point that today's, the topic of today's webinar really relates to what we term GIS field data collection, which is that range uh, of sub-meter type accuracy. So we're not intending to replace uh, survey uh, type uh, applications. You know, we're not using this solution to set building corners or to uh, dig, for example, if you have a pipeline under the ground. But if, you're, if your application uh, allows for or or requires sub-meter type accuracy, this is a really great solution for that, but it's not intended to replace survey type uh, applications. However, if you want to use survey type techniques to collect your data using polls and that type of things, we see a generally improved result as well when you post-process with this solution. Okay, let's go into those example data sets. Okay, the, uh, the, first, the first example data set is, that we had were mapping some assets around our factory here at Juniper Systems. Now, we, we mapped all of our assets. All the data collected that you're going to see today was done in a, a, a way that we used to try and simulate how a lot of GIS users would collect their data. We're not using polls. We're not allow, allowing the, the receiver to sit for a very long time at a, as a, at a particular point. We wanted to really kind of si simulate in the hand to field data collection how many of our users are actually doing that. So with this example, we did want to show a 60-second point average using GPS plus GLONASS uh, that was enabled in the Archer 2. What you're going to see is some red information that is real-time data. Later, you're going to see some green information that is your post-process data. So we wanted to kind of depict uh, using Google Earth, when we first look at our real-time data, we can see we first mapped this fire hydrant. You can see this small little shadow right there. That's where that fire hydrant actually was. When you took that first point with the Archer 2 real time, you see a rough measurement of about two meters. When you post-process that data, you can look at a really high confidence that you're within a three, three meter radius of the actual position. Now, this output here that you see, this is one of the little report outputs that you can see coming from EasyServe. You have a pretty nice standard deviation real time for your X and Y of 1.2 and about one meter. Um, that then would translate ultimately to your three meter uh, using two sigma uh, uh, standard deviation. Now, I collected this using Archer 2. We took a photo, as you can see there. When I post-process that data, you can see just on the, on the, the rough the, the measurement with Google Earth, you can see that green, that green post-processed point landing directly on top of that, that uh, that hydrant there. And when you look at the standard deviation, you can see that you have a much smaller standard deviation once the data is post-processed and a much higher accuracy confidence there of about 0.3 meters. 
And again, this is collected with a 60 point average. Now, one point to note is that typically we don't look at the heights using this GPS uh, type of data collection, the ellipsoid height. Uh, we know these, these heights to not be accurate using, for example, WGS84. Within EasyServe, as we'll discuss later, you can export and process against geoid models that can help you get a much better elevation reading if that's the type of data that you're interested in as well. Okay. The next slide, it's more of the same. I'll kind of run through this one quickly. So these are just a couple of more fire hydrants that we had mapped. We first see here, you can see that little red shaded area right there you can, uh, is where the actual fire hydrant is. You see the, the real-time result in red sitting at about, down here I made a little measurement you can see, sitting at about 1.5 to 2 meters right in there off of that point. You can see the small, the small shadow. Once I po post-process that data, you can see it then lining up much more closely to the actual position. So you see the green uh, sitting directly over that shaded hydrant there. Right over here, you also see that red position. Again, we're looking at anywhere from about 0.3 to 0.46 meters. Um, all right. Moving on to the next example, we also wanted to depict uh, a polygon. And this polygon was uh, captured with one point every second using both GPS and GLONASS. And we actually uh, wanted to uh, point out too that it's possible to use a discrete data collection for your polygon as well, where you're defining those points. So if you're doing things like mapping buildings where there's a very challenging GPS type scenario, you can take those points at that corner and have those points drawn straight directly between each other. This one was continuous, one point every second. So Back at our property, we have this grassy area, and we just wanted to, the, the, where I collected this data, I actually walked right along the curb here, directly along the curb, all, all along this grassy point here, all along that, and then where this building ended, I walked straight across here, and then followed the contour of the landscaping. Now you can see with this real-time data in red that it doesn't exactly follow the contour of that grass. It doesn't follow exactly where that grass is point. At the worst spot here where there's the biggest deviation, we see, you know, I did the little measuring tool in, within Google. You see somewhere about three meters. Um, exact, that's not an exact measurement, of course, but it's somewhere at about three meters at its worst spot. Over here, it generally was sitting at about two meters. There's some trees here that causes multi-path and cause, we believe, causing that to uh, show up off of the actual position. Here as well, where there's that biggest deviation, there was a multi-path caused by the building. It was obstructing some of the view of the satellites and, and causing the real-time results to be not quite as good. When we actually post-process that data, what you see is a uh, uh, a polygon that fits much closer to the the line that I walked. So again, walked right along the right along the sidewalk edge, then along the curb up here, and then this building edge was actually right through there. So you can see the polygon working a little closer. Then it starts to follow the contour of that line, and works, and 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 really matches a lot better than what we originally found in the real time scenario. All right, moving on to the next example. This similar to the polygon, we also collected a line. This was one point every second using GPS and GLONASS. And in this case, it was also at our factory. Here's, here's where the actual line using the real-time results from the Archer 2. I actually walked right down the center of that sidewalk. Then I got near this big tree. There's some multipath introduced from that tree as well as some coming from the building there. And then walked along the, the sidewalk as well. And this is not a bad result. I mean, the real-time results, we're very happy with that within the Archer. Um, we, it is the type of results that you would see. We spec it at two to five meters. We generally see about two meters in open sky. This is the type of accuracy that you would expect from a receiver of this class. And at this point, you can see here, when I did the little Google measuring tool, it worked out to about two meters off its position. Once I post-process that data, you can see a very straight line 
it almost looks as if I just drew that directly within Google Earth. It's something, uh, if you're passionate about GIS mapping, and it's really nice to see great looking data like that. And uh, that was really a, uh, really a nice result once we post-processed that data. Okay, at Juniper Systems, this type of environment, it really is, you know, we wanted to kind of show and do some testing here. However, we know that many of our, our users are and using our, our receivers and handhelds in in challenging, more extreme environments. We didn't want to have, we didn't want to do all of our testing in such a tame environment. And so that's why we took it to our our GPS, our Logan Canyon Dense Tree Canopy GPS test course. So to give you a little background, what we have here uh, in Logan Canyon near our factory, there's steep mountain valley uh, we have on each side. And then at the bottom of the canyon, as you can see, we have a lot of deciduous and mixed conifer tree canopy. So this is, a, as many of you know, we probably have a really long history Forestry is really important to our uh, to our customer base, and we wanted to make sure that our receivers work well in this type of an environment. And so, what we have is our own uh, GPS dense tree canopy test course that we've surveyed in. So we have some surveyed markers um, throughout this this area here. And what you see just really is kind of meant to show that these everything you see in red these were the real time results. So you see anywhere from about five meters, I wasn't able to fit it all there, but there was one all the way up to 14 meters off of the actual position. So according to the U.S. Forest Service, who we work with a lot at their dense tree canopy course, they consider in this type of an environment anywhere from about 8 to 12 meters is an acceptable range. So you see the real-time results of the Archer 2 landing within that acceptable range for a receiver of this class using the techniques that we used, uh, landing right within that acceptable range of about 8 to 12 meters. What's really interesting is that once you take that same data set and post-process it, you then see these results. We see a couple of the results were greater than 5 meters off the actual position, but not too far. They were just over 5 meters, but the majority of those results about 84% are lining up right under five meters, and you get some pretty excellent results. And of course, you know some of the different points are having, uh, you know, will show uh, more challenging than others. For example, now here's the example output from EasyServe. There's just some kind of little reports that let you know how well some of that is, some of that is going. You have your your standard deviations here once they're post-processed. Uh, showing a much smaller standard deviation than those real-time results. Now, it's also important to note, in this dense tree canopy example, we didn't use GLONASS. So as many of you who are familiar with GIS and particularly working uh, in forestry under trees or in challenging terrain or especially those working in far northern latitudes, uh, GLONASS will, will uh, effectively add a lot more satellites to your your solution and we're able to get a much better result. Uh, it really even improve upon those results even if you don't have the GLONASS enabled. So in this case we didn't want to enable the GLONASS. We did our tests with without it and just use the GPS satellites. So here's some, this this slide here, this next one is, is probably the most descriptive example in our Logan Canyon uh, GPS test course because it really kind of shows you know, the volatility that you see with a real-time result. And this is really true of, of, you know, all GPS. You know, when you get into these kind of challenging terrain, you start to have, uh, you start to see a little bit of variation and in, in your lines start to kind of go, you know, move in, in different directions. And that's just, you know, reflective of the, the multi-path that you're getting under that dense tree canopy. Now, you know, at its worst point from, so what, what this is, there's, an, there's actually a road that's going underneath these trees, and it's following really closely to the green line, which is the post-process data. And so you can see the green is much more smooth, kind of following underneath those trees. There's a point here where it's probably the biggest deviation that we're seeing, and that's right at about five meters, you know, somewhere in that neighborhood. Starting to go through here. Once you get into this point where you can see that the canopy starts to to open up, you can start to see that that the real time or the post-processed green line lines really closely to that road, 
and the real time result in red starts to gravitate back because it's losing, there's not quite as much multipath, it gravitates back to that post process line and then follows on to the end of the position. So this is really kind of one of the better examples to show, you know, what it looks like in a challenging terrain. I know that this is the topic of this discussion today is is submeter, but we know that many of our customers are working in environments where submeter without using uh, a lot different techniques, a lot more uh, complicated techniques is not really possible, but you can achieve a really good result using the same techniques that you use for your normal GIS collection with a little bit of post-processing at the end. All right, here's the last example uh, that we're going to show. This is a polygon. This one's not quite as descriptive because this polygon is under the canopy, so you don't get to quite see exactly the path that was walked. However, this is very close to the path that was walked in the green. Um, we do see, again, similar to the line, you see some deviation in the red. That's the real-time results. We see a, a deviation there of about four meters, and so it's just another example to show of how post-processing can kind of clean up your data from the when compared to real-time results. Okay, now we get on to the more fun part. So how does this all work? I wanted to, these next two sections with, we wanted to do a demonstration of both EasyTag CE as well as EasyServe and show you how it kind of all works. It's not intended to be a very detailed training. Certainly we have a lot of uh, quick training materials to get you started, you know, should you want to try this out yourself. Um, but it's not, it's just kind of meant to give you a, a, a taste of how it all works. All right. So we'll jump right into our EasyTag CE software demonstration running on an Archer 2. So I'm going to kind of change gears for just a moment here and switch over to my handheld. Bear with me. So this is an Archer 2 that I have connected to my computer, and we are connecting the little software utility that allows us to uh, allows you to see what's on my screen on the Archer 2. Um, it is connected through Wi-Fi to a different part of my building where I can get a, a actually get a fix because I'm in the middle of the building away from GPS signal. But EasyTag CE, it's a it's a it's a I would it has all the features that you would expect of a professional GIS and mapping software. So essentially you can import your data from your GIS. For example, if you're using a professional GIS, such as an Esri geodatabase, you can upload your shape files from that geodatabase and access and reference those, uh, those shape files while your users are in the field. And you can, you can also uh, look at your background imagery. So you can load background imagery into your Archer and, and zoom in to that imagery and, and it works it's pretty fast, um, and it's and it looks it it's basically has all those features and functionalities that you would expect. Before I actually collect some data, I wanted to kind of share with you some of those basic features and functionalities that you would expect. You have your sky plot. We haven't connected our GPS yet, so we'll go back and have a look at that in a little bit. So here I've gone and pointed the folder to my my background map. I've also have the ability to go and look at some shape files that I've loaded. So in this case, we're going to go ahead and turn on the shape files that I have loaded for this project. Here we have the buildings, the parcel outlines, the roads, as well as some light poles that we have mapped. So I'm going to go ahead and say OK. It takes just a moment to load those. We're going to go back to the plan view. At this point, I'm going to fit to my screen. I'm probably going to zoom in. This would, these are the parcels, you know, that are in our surrounding area. Here's our actual building here. You see the little light poles. I'm going to go ahead and zoom in on those just to kind of give us a little better reference. At this point, I'm going to go ahead and connect up our GPS. And again, it uh, takes just a moment to collect, connect for that first time, but uh, I am in, in the building, and so I'm not getting the best fix. You can see here my Accuracy of 7.2 is not as good as we normally see, but not bad for sitting inside a building. Um, normally, too, we'd probably see a lot more satellites. I generally see when I have GLONASS turned on, you know, anywhere from 13 to 14 satellites. Um, and so at this point, that little position there, that's my GPS position where we are inside the building. And the first step that I do for every single project, once you want to start collecting your data, 
you actually will go and you'll first connect your GPS. And at this point, we generally recommend that, you know, as with any GPS, it's good to let your GPS warm up, acquire its complete almanac, collect a good 15 minutes of data while it's sitting on the truck, while you're getting your project materials ready, that type of, uh, that type of thing. So you can make sure and get the best accuracy that you possibly can. So at this point, I will go ahead and start my survey. Okay, I'm going to actually name this survey Juniper Systems. So this is going to be a project folder where all of my uh, information from this particular project is going to be stored. I'm going to say OK. Takes a moment to load everything up. So we are now in a mode that you can actually go and collect your points, polygons, and lines. And uh, and what I would and what I would also mention is that we with Easy Tag CE, you have the ability to predefine a data dictionary. So this data dictionary allows you to define those features that you want the field crews or field workers to collect. And so that when they're out in the field, they see the types of features that are interesting or that they're required to collect. And you can easily change and transfer those, those data dictionaries to the Archer 2 and change between those data dictionaries. So as with any type of GPS software, there's you know, some getting used to some of the different icons, but really that's why we have the training material. It's really within you know, any, most of the users that we had when they watch one of the, our little five minute training videos, they can usually be up and running and collecting data within just a matter of five minutes or so. Um, with this, uh, here's that layer, man the, the view that we were talking about before. Here, you kind of see those those data elements that I transferred from our data dictionary. And so generally you would align those data dictionary elements to what you have listed in your, in your GIS so that when your field workers collect that data, they would ultimately export that data to a format that could be uploaded, such as shape, to your GIS. It would then uh, more easily integrate with your GIS. So in this case, a field worker would generally go and they would select the, the attribute or the feature that they want to go. And in this case, let's go ahead and map one of those fire hydrants. So I have the fire hydrant is now the active feature that can be mapped. And here's the really where the tag nomenclature comes within easy tag is that you essentially select the tag button. This is one the first I have a five second average. It just it just accomplished that five second average. My first attribute for a fire hydrant is to name the fire hydrant ID. At this point, it can be set up so that you have a barcode scanner, an RFID reader. Uh, all of those things can be integrated directly uh, into your field data collection if that's the type of data collection that you're doing. There's additional fields that I had set up related to that fire hydrant. So I'm not going to launch the actual camera application because again it's in a different part of the building but I would choose this button here I would first select that and then I would take my photo just like a, a normal photo so that's using the internal GPS of the Archer 2. At this point I'm just going to say OK. Takes just a moment and as you see we've mapped our first fire hydrant. So you know just to kind of pause and, and discuss a little more details about the Archer 2. This Archer 2 has a really long battery life. I mean, we generally see anywhere from 20 to 40 hours, uh, depending on the type of data collection that you're using. Uh, it will ha it can it has many different certifications that can be used for various environments, and it has both GPS and GLONASS. So um, that's just some of the other details surrounding this Archer 2. Now, if I want to go and collect a different feature, Let's go ahead and zoom back out actually first before I do that so we can see some of those parcel data. Keep going. Okay, so there we are. Now let's go ahead and collect a line, or we'll call it a trail. Okay, so now I see this is the, the line feature that's active. Again, I just go and select the different ones that I would want. I now see the the poll feature. So as you notice, you can also load your custom images, but there's also within that data dictionary a lot of different default images that you can select from. But if you want to load your own custom images, that's fine. So we'll go back to the trail. I'm going to do a quick demonstration of that. 
And again, I just push the tag button. I give the trail a name. We'll call it Juniper Systems Trail. It's collected that starting point. I'm going to say OK. I'm actually going to zoom in as well because you're seeing here I have some multi-path in the building and you're seeing the GPS drifting a little bit. Not very much, but drifting a little bit. But it's a good kind of demonstration to show if you were walking around how that how that would be uh, uh, depicted. So it's drawing, it's red, it means it's active, it's drawing that trail. When I'm ready to stop, I choose this button here. I can pause that trail. I can switch to discrete, meaning I choose when those when those points are being taken in the trail, or I can just take the close the trail. Okay, it's giving me one more chance to enter some a name for that trail. And now it's turned black, and you can see that that means that that trail has been uh, recorded. All right, I'm going to show one more example, and that's of a tree. So in this particular tree, when I take my GPS point, I'm going to hit the tag button again. Here, I had predefined some selection some some options for my field workers to see cottonwood maple other pine i'm going to choose the maple and i'm able to go through and enter some more additional attributes about that that tree maybe it needs pruning it's healthy fungus or diseased or something like that i'm going to say okay and you now see that tree now, uh, one, one more uh, area that I wanted to make sure and show is within your preferences. You have all of the different types of, of preferences that you would expect from a professional GIS system. So you have all of these different settings and options. So really, if you want to, if you're, we'll just kind of run through these really quick. You have your language options. Where are your, this is the place where your data dictionaries are stored. These are the where your survey folders are stored. So the surveys are the projects that you have. These are your GSS, GNSS settings. What COM port does your Archer use? These are kind of just one-time setups that you do. If you have to, you know, there's alarms that can be set depending on the different types of uh, uh, um, GPS collection you're doing. You have your resources alarms. You know, if you have an antenna height, you can define that. You can choose your data dictionary. I only have my Juniper Systems data dictionary, but if you don't choose to have a data dictionary, then you will just get the default one, which is just allows you to write the ID as well as some comments about that point. So you don't have to create a data dictionary. Running through these kind of quickly, here's where you can define your average point, your vert, you know, parameters. You can go from seconds, seconds and up, for example. You can change from meters to metric or meters to US square feet. And then this one, uh, I have the GPS turned on, so I'm not able to change this at the moment. But what I can show you once I turn that GPS off is it supports a wide range of mapping systems as well. So it's certainly able to um, understand and comprehend those different mapping systems. So plan view, north type, true north, magnetic north, you can set up if you have a crew of workers, you can set up user profiles. You just add user profiles that's selected upon startup. You can define your scales. And we're going to say OK and get back to that. And so this really uh, is, like I mentioned, a very handy GPS, very easy to use. If I wanted to navigate to one of these points, I'm going to go ahead and zoom back out. So let's just choose a feature. For example, one of those light poles over there. If I want to navigate to it, I would just select select that light pole. It said that it's also sitting within a, a polygon, and it's asking me which one I want to select. I want to navigate to that light pole. I just choose the Navigate button. It's going to show me it's 161 meters to that light pole in a straight line. There's a couple of other navigation views, but this one's really handy. You just start walking in that direction, and when you arrive at that point, it shows you getting closer, and then it makes a loud kind of alarm noise when you've actually arrived and showed, showed that you've arrived there. So really handy feature. 
I'm going to go ahead and stop this survey. So our project now data has now been completed. I'm going to go ahead and disconnect my GPS because I want to quickly show you within the press in the preferences you do have a wide range of mapping systems that are supported everything that you would expect uh, for the various types of uh, locations and systems that you have so if you have data that's projected in, in different systems you can comprehend that data appropriately on your map okay at this point really I would really at this point you're done collecting your project the process would be that you uh, just exit your project let me turn that off I say okay I'm done collecting my data I now want to exit my project how that how it would normally work now is that I come back to my home screen on the Archer 2 when I get back to the office I would connect my field PC to the computer through various methods we have a nice docking station that connects you can put it in there and it will charge your your archer as well as synchronize your data um, you can also connect directly to the USB port or in this case like I've done I have Wi-Fi connection and you can then you can basically then just transfer from your file explorer I already have my just like you would any other um, any other uh, computer you see I have a bunch of different things on there in this case I will go to my easy tag CE surveys there's my Juniper systems project that I just had and the various files associated with that I would just drag those to my desktop which I've already done here on my desktop this is a uh, an, some data that I collected a little bit earlier before the webinar because I've already transferred it over to my computer. At this point, you're now back to the office. You have your real-time results. If you're not going to use EasyServe, if you just want to look at your data on a map and run with it, you have these, when you buy EasyTag, you get these on-pause field tools. Here's the spot where I would go and create that data dictionary. Again, there's the My Data Dictionary that I had created. There's all the different feature elements uh, that I have gone and created for that particular project I won't go into a whole lot of detail here but at this point you can look and see all of the different uh, types of feature elements that you have so here is that there was that fire hydrant for example you can see that's where I added the photo the fire hydrant if I wanted to add a di an additional one I can go and choose you know is it alphanumeric a logical choice a single choice date time type attribute a picture this is where you would define if you wanted to use a barcode scanner RFID integrate camera those types of things as well so that's where you would go and and keep your and create and keep your data dictionary and you can go and create as many of those as you want and transfer those to the Archer 2 and the users can select those directly in the field but at this point if I wasn't going to post process I could go directly to my export features at this where I choose the source file and I would go I think I put that on my desktop here there it is I would choose my GPS file and then I would export to the desktop for example I can export to Google Earth I can export to CSV AutoCAD DXF an Esri shape file and yes I can export to a lot of different coordinate and mapping systems as well as to mean sea level geoids for example not going to export now so that's how I would actually go off and look at my data if I didn't want to post process but again going back if we do want to post process post process our data when you load bring your files back to your desktop PC all you need to do again I'm going to open those files I see these files that we collected in the field I have easy serve already open the very first thing that I tell people when I open up EasyServe is that EasyServe is a very powerful uh, post-processing software. It has a lot going on. There's a lot of professional surveyors that use this software. A lot of uh, it has a lot of different features and functionalities that are typically not required for this type of a use case within the GIS market. That said, if you want to get crazy and and do a lot of these utilize some of these additional features, you have that 
certainly is an option. But here is the typical workflow that, that I use and that others that use this within a GIS submeter accuracy type uh, data collection with their Archer 2. So as I mentioned, first thing I do, I drag the files off of the Archer 2 onto somewhere on your computer. That's what I've done here. I just copied them to my desktop. I can then take this GPS file here. I move it over. I'm going to close this down or minimize that. So I now have my file sitting here in the middle. Again, don't be intimidated by all of these different uh, icons and everything. There's really only a few that are required to know. And what I'm going to do now is in the, in the, the biggest, one, the best one is here. This is the one that actually starts processing. That's how you post-process your data. I'm going to really quickly show you the GIS feature summary. This is my raw data, okay? I have not post-processed it yet. This is just a little report. It shows not a bad standard deviation, 1.2, 1 meter. You know, that translates, uh, if you do the math, it's something like 2 meters, maybe a little more, 2 to 3 meters. Um, again, I'm going to turn that off because I'm going to go back to my tools file. I'm going to say new. Say no, just a moment. Okay, here we go. Again, I'm going to go back and drag that file in just a moment. Okay, there's that data set. Okay, I've dragged my file in there. I just push this button. It's going around. It's looking for the base stations. So one thing to note about post-processing is when you collect your data in the field, you have to wait until the base, net, the base station that's closest to you uh, publishes its corrections data. So what this is doing is it's going off and looking at a base station that's closest to me, and you set this up once, and it's not a hard setup, but essentially you just set it up to go and find uh, the closest base station to where you are. Um, it's found, in this case, if we look at this little, little report, it found a base station that's 19 kilometers away, its name is P125. We know that this base station is only processing with GPS satellites because not all base stations are created equal, but generally, uh, even with just GPS, you get a really nice result, as we're going to see here in a moment. Bear with me. I'm going to close this one down. We're now going to go back and look at the GIS feature summary. So you see here you got a standard deviation Without GLONASS, just GPS, you get a nice standard deviation for all of those fire hydrants that we had. So this is the same data set that I used uh, a little bit previously when I was collecting all of that data. Now if I want to go Tools, Export, Features, oh, we have to save our, bear with me here. Let me really quickly pull that data in. I forgot to save my project. Bear with me. I'm going to say file new. There we go. Trevor, it's just that you closed the window with. Ah, OK. Uh, Thank you. So you just had to do view and reopen. Uh, ah, OK. Thank you. So I'm glad we have uh, Stephanie on the line to help there. We're going to reprocess our data really quick here. There we go. It's almost done. So it's the window. You close the view. So if you would go under view, you can reopen the view that you you have. Ah, uh, okay. So view so here. I'm going to go like this. Close it here. Then I'm going to go view. Or, so you're in the project manager view. Yes, exactly. Now I want to go ahead and show you. Let me save the project really quick. It's saving the project. I'm going to go Tools, Export, Features. All right, and so we're now back to that export, the same type of export features that we saw from our OnPause field tools. So as you can see, there's your input file that we have that's post-processed. 
you can choose the output destination. So if we just choose our desktop, for example, in this case, I'm just going to kind of quickly choose the Google Earth view. But again, you have the options to export to a shapefile, CSV, or an AutoCAD DXF. Once you are happy with your selection. So for example, one other kind of interesting thing to note is if you do choose a particular coordinate and you're exporting to, uh, say, for example, into some NAT83 uh, system, then you can save that profile so you don't always have to go and keep uh, reselecting that every time. At this point, I would just export. I see the folder was created over there. I can go and just open and export that, uh, open it directly from here. But in this case, I'm just, I already have Google Earth open and the data set loaded. And you would see that same data set that we had talked about earlier in the example data set. So you see that is where the fire hydrants were located. You have that polygon as well as my green post-processed line. So really, uh, that's the, the, the primary pieces of, of the solution that we wanted to work. What we wanted to intend to show is that, you know, post-processing has been around for a long time, uh, but really, you know, when combined with EasyTag CE software, it's a pretty powerful tool. And what we generally see, I'm going to go back to our presentation here. So what we generally see with this type of solution is that when, if you're trying to achieve GIS submeter accuracy, you generally, are, if you need to buy a handheld that has a submeter GPS class receiver there, um, you op which generally, from what we see, costing somewhere about five or six thousand um, dollars, you then still have to buy your your mobile software in many cases, and often you still need to utilize external equipment such as a more expensive external receiver that you might be collecting because especially when you get into the dense tree canopy type situation, a lot of those multi-path signals are being rejected by those various class receivers. But with this solution, you're seeing something. So if you're looking at about you know five or six thousand dollars, you know this with this solution, you're you're somewhere about half of that, or even a little bit less. And this is where you know we really feel that you know this is really a great solution for GIS submeter accuracy on a budget. It is a post-process solution, so you do have to wait for base station data to be published. But this is usually published by most base stations around North America. Uh, on the hour, if not certainly by the next day. So for example, if you did some work one day, um, you may have to wait for your particular base station to publish its data before you can actually post-process. You may have to wait for uh, an hour or less, depending on when you collected that data, or to be a different solution, you can try it again and, and do it the very next day. And you, will, you can achieve the similar results that we had here. So, just wanted to leave a little bit of time and move on to any types of questions. So, Scott, do you, are there questions that uh, that people have entered along the way? And he may be muted. Great. Okay. Well, certainly, thank you for attending today's webinar. If there are any questions, please be sure to type those because we are going to be following up with all the questions. Hey, oh, yeah. Sorry about that. That's I okay. I had double muted myself. I unmuted my phone, but not on the panel. Got it. Um, I just wanted to mention we had a lot of really good questions. We've answered most of those. Um, okay. We have quite, quite a few more we need to answer that have, have come in. Okay. Um, I think we'll just, we can an answer those offline if you'd like. That's great. Um, a lot of them are really good. So Great. Well, it sounds like we have a lot of questions. We will certainly follow up uh, after the web webinar with each of you. We will also send out just a email thank you as well as a, uh, a link. We will make this, as I mentioned earlier, this webinar available to uh, to you so that you can re-watch it or share it with others. Um, what I also wanted to mention, definitely if you, uh, if you have a project that you're interested to see if this solution would work or if we would recommend it for that for that your particular application if you haven't noticed we're we are definitely passionate about field data collection 
Uh, we like to live vicariously through the very interesting projects that our customers have, and so we are always happy to uh, discuss your projects here at Juniper Systems. Please feel free to give us a call, and as always, you if you do own one of our handhelds, you have free live technical support. You can call in. You will always talk to a real person and we will be able to get back to you. So thank you for joining today's webinar and I hope that you have a very good day and uh, we will talk to you later. Thank you.